When MacDonald, in the relaxed atmosphere of Peter Ramster's rooms in Sydney, gives no outward impression of wild imaginings, she's a very down-to-earth woman, untravelled, and with little knowledge of life in England, even modern life there. To her, the notion of any past life came only under hypnosis. And then, in trance, came the change, from now to then, from today in Australia to a life two centuries ago in the pastoral setting of England's West Country. Producer Brian Morris joined our on-camera team in the search for Gwen's past. Guided by the recordings of her memories under hypnosis, we tried first to locate the general area she'd talked about. Have you heard of Glastonbury? The Glaston. What about Taunton? In Market, Taunton. What are the other villages around your area so we can find your village? Oh, the, um... Alford. There'd be, uh... There'd be Blarton. There'd be... Uh, Stone Chapel. Interesting names, but not there. Not on the most modern and large-scale maps. So, to old ones, and older, and back to the 18th century ones. And suddenly the names began to leap out at us. Alford was there. Stone became Stone Chapel, and there was Horn Blotton, very close to the way she'd pronounced it. Now it was a matter of getting closer. Gwen's taped voice guiding our search was different somehow, not the way she usually spoke. It was slower, accented, and there was an odd word she used. Tell me about where you live. Uh, in cottage. Could you describe it for me? Small. Not big. A bit thatch roof. A bit room down. A tallet. A tallet? What was a tallet? No one in Australia seemed to know, and we couldn't find a reference book or a major dictionary with the answer. It went on puzzling us. A drying room. And a back. Actually, uh, that wasn't on there. In England, we looked at cottages and houses all across and about the part of Somerset so clear in Gwen's mind, and none of them fitted her description. But she was remembering across a two-century gap, and things had changed. She was deep in some other life. What was your name? Mary Duncan. They call me Rose. English Rose, they say. Tell me about your mother. What's your mother's name? Elizabeth. She died when I was born. What was your mother's maiden name? What family did she come from? Lethbridge, Bessie said. Have the temper of a Lethbridge. Temper of my grandfather. The search was twofold. Mm -hmm. Where had she lived? And was there fact in what she said under hypnosis? Did she make up unconsciously the names of her mother's family, the Lethbridges? And of the local gentry? Was there in that small pocket of Somerset a James Mackenzie whose name she recalled? A squire called Hugh Somerville? Consistently, the old books and registers showed she was right. 
even to her use of that strange and long obsolete word, talent. Turn the um, talent you were asking about. Really? Yeah. West, um, West Somerset word book. Hayloft over uh, a stable. Stable, of course. Exactly. Does that make sense what you're looking for? Well, that seemed to have solved part of one problem. And we took the rest to an expert who was later to act as our witness. This Blossom or Blousen, and later on became Horn Blossom. So we're pretty convinced now that the uh, Blouton she talks about is Horn Blossom. Well, this is um, interesting because, in fact, the older form of Horn Blossom had um, an O sound in it. So that uh, it looks as if uh, she is hitting on uh, an older form which has now been corrupted to Horn Blossom. So that's very satisfactory. But I'm, I'm convinced that there's, there's something in it. So what we're going to do now to find where Gwen, as Rose Duncan, had lived, and to take that independent witness with us. Dr. Basil Cottle is reader in medieval studies in the English department of Bristol University. And he agreed with us that we should make another blindfold test. We took Gwen into the wide general area she'd described under hypnosis in Australia, the area we had first begun to search. Hey, how is it? Dr. Cottle watching very carefully Gwen's every move studying her every word. That doesn't feel right that way. It's this way. And through the wood that way. I feel that that way. She was pointing to the area around Clanville, a place of few and scattered houses where she claimed there had been five shops. This flat piece here feels right and this this curve this curve here I'm sure this is where they were I'm sure this is where the shops were on an old map on that curve five buildings show five cottage shops perhaps well around that bend if you turn that way I'm sure you'll come to the stream a, around that bend stream. oh yes it's water it's water I can feel it and then you go across that I think if you find a stream there, you'll, you'll, you'll see where it divides and you go across the, the, the stones, then you'll come to where I used to live. It wasn't that easy, not just a matter of walking there. Oh, yes, always. In the two centuries past, always. the country has been reshaped. Marshy land has been drained, woods have been cut and cleared, and fences have enclosed open land. But some things remain constant, like a watercourse, a river which Gwen had told us divided in a fork. And that's where she took us, to that river. Yes, I see. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. Well, I reckon, down there. If you follow this down to the bottom, I think you'll come across the stepping stone. Dr. Cottle, demanding but fair, summed up that far. I think that we have given Gwen very few uh, direct clues to what was being done. But I would emphasize that the test has been a wholly fair one, and I must say that I feel a little more persuaded than I did at the beginning of the proceedings. But my mind is still open. The next morning, we renewed the search. Gwen had taken us to the watercourse, but we weren't yet close to where she'd lived. She was having some trouble finding her way without landmarks in a countryside so much altered. I, is, what's that over there? Well, that's where it was. I lived, if that's the wood, I lived here. And the wood was there. And it looks like a wood, Peter. Oh, it looks like... Is there a landmark or something else? One would be able to recognise this spot from? Not far. About 20 minutes to walk from edge of wood. Be this side of stream, be wood. Be not far. Hmm. In the 18th century, the straight path from Clanville, which Rose Duncan used to follow, led her to the fork in the water and so to her cottage. Dr. Cottle, determined to put her to the test, said that if she knew where the river divided, she should take us along the line of the water. And Gwen, out of time as well as out of place, led us on a seven-mile walk. 
But then suddenly the scent grew strong, and she took us again to the sound of water buried in the greenery. Listen to the stream, listen. This was the key to the puzzle for Gwen. This was where Rose Duncan had crossed the river to go to her cottage. Below a waterfall, the fork in the stream was there, just as she has said it would be. And she was off, moving with the purpose of someone who knows where she is and where to go. She led us unerringly now across fields and through nettle hedges in a beeline for a place we couldn't see. It was afternoon and Rose Duncan was on familiar ground. Home ground. I think maybe that could be it. Her mood changed in a sharp moment, almost to a little fear, as though the past was overwhelming her. And of all the houses we'd looked at and crossed off, she led us across country to the very first we had checked. It still seemed not to fit her description in any way at all, except perhaps for a loft. Was this her talent? It looked as though what she called her cottage was a barn alongside a newer house, but she insists overwhelming her. And of all the houses we'd looked at and crossed off, she led us across country to the very first we had checked. It still seemed not to fit her description in any way at all, except perhaps for a loft. Was this her talent? It looked as though what she called her cottage was a barn alongside a newer house, but she insisted and Dr. Cottle asked her to draw it as she remembered it. And this was, there was a door here, and a window here. Right? This, and the, the roof. Now, that's, that's the front. And looking from the back, on this side, there was a piece that came down, like that, like that, added on, and this in here was back to back with the fire that was inside and was used as a drying room. And you came through here into there. In here was our, what you call, everything room. And here would be like the bedroom. Go through there, there was a little room there that I had, and out a back door. Then she led us around to what is now the back of the cottage. <laughs> my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Once again, we saw the now familiar reaction of tears as the shock hit home. The doctor may have been moved, but that didn't sway his assessment of what we had found here in an old cottage in Somerset. There should be a door, but I don't think it is. I think it's a window and the door was closer. Well, the slightly, un slightly unsatisfactory thing is that there is supposed to be a door just to the right of this lean-to and a window towards the pine end. A window, in fact, which at one time lit the room in which Gwen slept. Uh, the door is now only a window, but admittedly it's got a great beam across that at one time might window. have accommodated the door. If Gwen was right, we should be able to see her bedroom window, but there was no sign of it from outside. Well, could we go inside possibly and see that? Now that she was at the cottage, Gwen knew where to go and what to expect inside. We went through what she said had been her father's bedroom. What do you think, Doctor? Uh, yes, I think it has been a bit renewed, but... Was there a, an upstairs? Yeah, a towel. That's so, a uh, towel. You uh -huh. can see... Yeah, it kind of makes it the old shape. Was that wall there, Gwen? No, one big room. And see, there's... Yeah, this there's of the window. Can we... That was the... Yeah, that indeed was more or less the position of the window as you chose it, I think. Yeah, yeah look, you And indeed it was. The tendrils of the ivy covering the outside view couldn't hide the unmistakable shape or the massive rock and smaller stones used to block the light of that window for the past long years. Yeah. Was this the right floor, Gwen? It was a stone floor. No, it was not even like this. I suppose it's sunk a bit over the years and that, but yeah. it wasn't uneven, it was even. Is that the same 
sort of floor that's in Mr. Brown's cottage? Oh, no, it's, uh, they're, they're more or less, uh, well, similar, but more pockmarked, more marked. More rough, oh, yeah. Rough. The Mr. Brown's cottage mentioned was yet another part of our search. Mr. Brown and Rose Duncan had met near one of England's oldest and most famous landmarks, a place Gwen had spoken of under hypnosis in Sydney. You'll be able to see out, and I want you to tell me, where are you? The Abbey. What's the name of the Abbey? St. Michael's Abbey. I'll be taking stones out of St. Michael's Abbey to put on the floor. You shouldn't do that. Five miles away lies not St. Michael's, but Glastonbury Abbey, an ancient and plundered ruin even in the time of Rose Duncan. But the Abbey does lie in the shadow of St. Michael's Mount, crowned by the chapel of St. Michael. It took stones for floor and house. <sighs> I shouldn't touch stones. Did you see them move any stones at any time? No, oh, I... Mr. Brown, he put stone on his floor. Gwen had told in trance of how Rose liked to visit the ruins of the Abbey, and how one day there she had cut her foot and been found hobbling by Mr. Brown, who lived a mile away on the far side. He'd taken her to his cottage and bathed and bandaged her injured foot, and she remembered him and his house for that kind act. Now she led us to where he had lived. There'd be five houses on the other side of the street. That's it. There'd be a second one from the end. I'm sure that's it. Across that West of England stream, two cottages only remain of the original five. The cottages are possibly what Gwen remembers. They're in the right spot. They are near a river. Uh, they, I do believe, were once cottages, although they're now a a um, little home for chickens and things, but uh, they are cottages and we hear that uh, they once had a fireplace. Uh, Rose Cottage itself, if I can call it that, right. now called Easton, uh, well, when we arrived there, uh, Gwen showed signs of distinct emotion, which uh, might be convincing but need not be. What convinces me much more is that she did give beforehand uh, a quite reasonable plan, as it were, of what it was going to look like. She showed us a pent roof and windows in approximately the right places, and the place, uh, as a place 200 years old, is fairly convincing. One of the things that convinced me most was the, her pronunciation of um, Hornblotten as Blorton, but I happen to know that that is the form of pronunciation, and I happen to believe that Gwen probably didn't have access to the fact that it was the form of pronunciation. I don't think either she or any informants in Australia could have told her that. But there's one word that she has used which could be a crucial proof uh, that she is really repeating something uh, heard in a previous existence, and that is the obsolete West Country word, a talent for a loft. So I think what remains now is for us to clean up the floor of this chicken house, which belongs to Jason's father here, <laughs> and then we shall see if the markings tally with the markings which Gwen remembered on stones brought into here by her friend Mr. Brown. B, a thick stone, square, and spiral, circle-like, and... It had a spiral circle on the stone. Aye, in corner on right side, and... Funny writing, like cut in rock, cut in stone. To open your eyes and to stay, to remain in trance, I want you just to open your eyes, take the pen off me and draw. This was something quite gripping. The markings she made were not writing, not anything formal. 
and that meant that if Gwen under hypnosis could see those strange and unique markings, and if we could find her stone, then we could either disprove her story or prove it solidly. <laughs> this was where we would find out, one way or the other. It was 24 hours later, and the floor of that poultry shed was clean of a century's dirt and droppings. Farmer Dennis Simmons had been surprised to find there was a stone floor in his shed, and the distinctive Glastonbury Abbey stone at that, and even more startled when Gwen found the particular stone she had said would be there. I think there was two. What are the odds against an Australian housewife in the late 20th century drawing under hypnosis the markings on a stone buried in England these hundreds of years and getting them anything like right? A million to one? The farmer's family watched unbelievingly and their look said at least a million to one. There didn't at first seem to be any sign of Gwen's markings on the wet stone. We dried it and brushed it with talcum powder. Mm -hmm. Seems like the top of Scotland coming out. Yes, it is too. See? Yes. Yes, it's coming up well, actually. Yeah, yeah, see all these little curves and midges. Do you recognise anything else there? Yeah. A spiral, looks like a spiral. The original one was drawn in Sydney. Oh, right. Oh, close. right, it is close. Huh. You've got your thing, your ass there, you've got a little squiggle there, you've got a little squiggle there. You've got that curving around there, you have that curving around there. That's quite right, you do. It comes up and down, round. It comes up, it comes down, around and up. It comes down and around again. And you've got that again. You've got that quite clearly, that round ring there. And you've got a little squiggle like the start of a two there. So that's very, very close to what you draw. This is the way the stone looked to us and our camera. Let's make the markings as clear to you now as they seemed to us then on that day in that dark old shed. The stone and the drawing done in Sydney. However long those million to one odds seemed, the effect on farmer Dennis Simmons and his family was unmistakable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did you mention that to anybody? No, we didn't say anything because we all thought you were mad. <laughs> Are we still mad? No, no, no. <laughs> Explain reincarnation by saying that it is fantasy or genetic memory or something that they've read in a book. I don't believe it's fantasy because, for a start, the film deals in fact, not fantasy. Uh, it can't be genetic memory because people don't go down the same genetic line as their own ancestry. And as far as books are concerned, well, people could have read some of it in books, but I don't believe they could have read all the information that this film has brought out. Well, where does the truth lie? Religions of all kinds teach us about an afterlife. Some of them speak of a limbo, a timeless place of waiting to achieve something higher. And some speak of reincarnation itself, of a rebirth on the human plane after physical death. These are ancient and deep-rooted beliefs in all mankind. And science is now acknowledging how little we know of life beyond the body, the life of the mind. About its ability to recall, to project, to contact other minds about its ability to survive is that what it is then if reincarnation exists is it the survival of the human mind a power source unwilling to be switched off when the body dies and looking for another outlet and if not then what what makes ordinary people make the extraordinary claim that they've lived before perhaps it's the universal desire not just to finish not simply to accept that it's all over. The universal hope that there's more to come and something better at that. And the human craving to know. To know whether there's anything after death. And if there is, what is it and where is it? You to begin to relive now, point just after you died. You feel yourself going to wherever it was that the man took you after you talked to him. For Dorothy Hellman, it was heaven and a loving reunion. And walking along, just walking along the road, I can see a snickle. He 
his papa. His papa. Papa! 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 Where did you go? Why did you leave me alone? Oh, Papa. One final question. Who were you before? overwhelming her and of all the houses we'd looked at and crossed off she led us across country to the very first we had checked it still seemed not to fit her description in any way at all except perhaps for a loft was this her talent it looked as though what she called her cottage was a barn alongside a newer house but she insisted and dr cottle asked her to draw it as she remembered it and this was there was a door here and a window here right this and the, the roof. Now, that's, that's the front. And looking from the back, on this side, there was a piece that came down like that, like that, added on. And this in here was back to back with the fire that was inside and was used as a drying room. And you came through here into there. In here was our, what you call, everything room. And here, wouldn't be like the bedroom. Go through there, there was a little room there that I had, and out a back door. Then she led us around to what is now the back of the cottage. <laughs> my God. Oh, my God. Even the little window you put on the And once again, we saw the now familiar reaction of tears as the shock hit home. The doctor may have been moved, but that didn't sway his assessment of what we had found here in an old cottage in Somerset. There should be a door, but I don't think it is. I think it's a window and the door was closer. Well, the slightly, un slightly unsatisfactory thing is that there is supposed to be a door just to the right of this lean-to and a window towards the pine end. A window, in fact, which at one time lit the room in which Gwen slept. Uh, the door is now only a window, but admittedly it's got a great beam across that at one time might window. have accommodated the door. If Gwen was right, we should be able to see her bedroom window, but there was no sign of it from outside. Well, could we go inside possibly and see that? Now that she was at the cottage, Gwen knew where to go and what to expect inside. We went through what she said had been her father's bedroom. What do you think, Doctor? Uh, yes, I think it has been a bit renewed, but... Was there a, an upstairs? Yeah, a towel. That's so a towel. You uh -huh. can see... Yeah, it kind of made the old shape. Was that the wall there, Gwen? No, one big room. And see, there's... Yeah, this there's of the window. Can we... That was the... Yeah, that indeed was more or less the position of the window as you chose it, I think. Yeah, yeah look, you And indeed it was. The tendrils of the ivy covering the outside view couldn't hide the unmistakable shape or the massive rock and smaller stones used to block the light of that window for the past long years. Yeah. Was this the right floor, Gwen? It was a stone floor. No, it was not even like this. I suppose it's sunk a bit over the years and that, but yeah. it wasn't uneven, it was even. Is that the same sort of floor as in Mr. Brown's cottage? Oh, no, it's, uh, they're, they're more or less, uh, well, similar, but more pockmarked, more marked. More rough, oh, yeah. Rough. The Mr. Brown's cottage mentioned was yet another part of our search. 
Mr. Brown and Rose Duncan had met near one of England's oldest and most famous landmarks, a place Gwen had spoken of under hypnosis in Sydney. I need to be able to see out, and I want you to tell me, where are you? The Abbey. What's the name of the Abbey? St. Michael's Abbey. I'll be taking stones out of St. Michael's Abbey to put on the floor. I shouldn't do that. Five miles away lies not St. Michael's, but Glastonbury Abbey, an ancient and plundered ruin even in the time of Rose Duncan. But the Abbey does lie in the shadow of St. Michael's Mount, crowned by the chapel of St. Michael. It took stones for floor and house. <sighs> I shouldn't touch stones. Did you see them move any stones at any time? No, oh, I... Mr. Brownie put stone on his floor. Gwen had told in trance of how Rose liked to visit the ruins of the Abbey, and how one day there she had cut her foot and been found hobbling by Mr. Brown, who lived a mile away on the far side. He'd taken her to his cottage and bathed and bandaged her injured foot, and she remembered him and his house for that kind act. Now she led us to where he had lived. be five houses on the other side of the street. That's it. There'd be a second one from the end. I'm sure that's it. Across that West of England stream, two cottages only remain of the original five. The cottages are possibly what Gwen remembers. They're in the right spot. They are near a river. Uh, they, I do believe, were once cottages, although they're now a a um, little home for chickens and things, but uh, they are cottages and we hear that uh, they once had a fireplace. Uh, Rose Cottage itself, if I can call it that, right. now called Easton, uh, well, when we arrived there, Gwen showed signs of distinct emotion, which uh, might be convincing but need not be. What convinces me much more is that she did give beforehand uh, a quite reasonable plan, as it were, of what it was going to look like. She showed us a pent roof and windows in approximately the right places, and the place, uh, as a place 200 years old, is fairly convincing. One of the things that convinced me most was the her pronunciation of um, Hornblotten as Blorton, because I happen to know that that is the form of pronunciation, and I happen to believe that Gwen probably didn't have access to the fact that it was the form of pronunciation. I don't think either she or any informants in Australia could have told her that. But there's one word that she has used which could be a crucial proof uh, that she is really repeating something uh, heard in a previous existence, and that is the obsolete West Country word, a talent for a loft. So I think what remains now is for us to clean up the floor of this chicken house, which belongs to Jason's father here, <laughs> and then we shall see if the markings tally with the markings which Gwen remembered on stones brought into here by her friend Mr. Brown. B, thick stone, square, and spiral, circle-like, and... It had a spiral circle on the stone. Aye, in corner on right side, and... Funny right and like cut in rock, cut in stone. To open your eyes and to stay, to remain in trance, I want you just to open your eyes, take the pen off me and draw. This was something quite gripping. The markings she made were not writing, not anything formal. And that meant that if Gwen, under hypnosis, could see those strange and unique markings, and if we could find her stone, then we could either disprove her story or prove it solidly. This was where we would find out, one way or the other. 
It was 24 hours later, and the floor of that poultry shed was clean of a century's dirt and droppings. Farmer Dennis Simmons had been surprised to find there was a stone floor in his shed, and the distinctive Glastonbury Abbey stone at that, and even more startled when Gwen found the particular stone she had said would be there. I think there was two. What are the odds against an Australian housewife in the late 20th century drawing under hypnosis the markings on a stone buried in England these hundreds of years and getting them anything like right? A million to one? The farmer's family watched unbelievingly and their look said at least a million to one. There didn't at first seem to be any sign of Gwen's markings on the wet stone. We dried it and brushed it with talcum powder. Sounds like the top of Scotland coming in. Yes, it is too. See? Yes. Yes, it's coming in well, actually. Yeah, yeah, see all these little curves and midges. Do you recognise anything else there? Yeah. A spiral, looks like a spiral. The original one was drawn in Sydney. Oh, right. Oh, close. right, it is close. Huh. You've got your thing, your arts there, you've got a little squiggle there, you've got a little squiggle there. You've got that curving around there, you have that curving around there. That's quite right, you do. It comes up and down, round. It comes up, it comes down, around and up, and it comes down and around again. And you've got that again, you've got that quite clearly, that round ring there, and you've got a little squiggle like the start of a two there, so that's very, very close to what you draw. This is the way the stone looked to us and our camera. Let's make the markings as clear to you now as they seemed to us then on that day in that dark old shed. The stone and the drawing done in Sydney. However long those million to one odds seemed, the effect on farmer Dennis Simmons and his family was unmistakable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did you mention that to anybody else? No, we didn't say anything because we all thought you were mad. <laughs> Are we still mad? No, no, no. <laughs> Are you sure? Explain reincarnation by saying that it is fantasy or genetic memory or something that they've read in a book. I don't believe it's fantasy because, for a start, the film deals in fact, not fantasy. Uh, it can't be genetic memory because people don't go down the same genetic line as their own ancestry. And as far as books are concerned, well, people could have read some of it in books, but I don't believe they could have read all the information that this film has brought out. Well, where does the truth lie? Religions of all kinds teach us about an afterlife. Some of them speak of a limbo, a timeless place of waiting to achieve something higher. And some speak of reincarnation itself, of a rebirth on the human plane after physical death. These are ancient and deep-rooted beliefs in all mankind. And science is now acknowledging how little we know of life beyond the body, the life of the mind. About its ability to recall, to project, to contact other minds. About its ability to survive. Is that what it is then? If reincarnation exists, is it the survival of the human mind? A power source unwilling to be switched off when the body dies and looking for another outlet. And if not, then what? What makes ordinary people make the extraordinary claim that they've lived before? Perhaps it's the universal desire not just to finish, not simply to accept that it's all over. The universal hope that there's more to come and something better at that. And the human craving to know. To know whether there's Anything after death, and if there is, what is it, and where is it? You're going to begin to relive now, the point just after you died. And you feel yourself going to wherever it was that the man took you after you talked to him. For Dorothy Hellman, it was heaven and a loving reunion. And walking along, just walking along the road. I can see his nickel. His papa. His papa. Papa! 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 Where did you go? Where 
One final question. Who were you before?